All right. Well, thank you guys for coming out today. I really appreciate it. Again, I am Danielle Caronca, the Outreach Coordinator for uh, Central Valley Robotics. So um, you can come up if you have any other questions after this session. Feel free to come up and ask me any questions, um, and I'll direct you in the right place. So um, let's go ahead and get started here. Um, again, our Q&A with First Lego League veteran coaches and our introduction to First um, judging was switched. The rooms were switched, so if you think this is intro to judging, it is not. That is happening in the NPR. Um, so, just clarifying that. All right. Um, so, here today with me, we have uh, Kenan Lane from the Electric Legos and Lisa Bath and Bionic Brains. Okay. So they are some veteran coaches who are going to give you guys a little bit of information about what they went through, and I'll just leave it to you guys. So if you want to introduce yourself, then go ahead. Hmm. Well, I'm, I'm Lisa Bath, and I've coached for the past three years at Garfield Elementary, and our team is Bionic Brains. If you've been around before, our shirts were blue. We had a little cute little logo. Um, so we did three years, and that first year is like drinking from a fire hose. So in, how many of you guys are first-year coaches or considering being a first-year coach? In, okay. In second year? Third? Okay. <clears throat> so a lot of you guys are first-year coaches. Well, I'm going to let them introduce themselves, and then we'll, we'll get into more information. Well, thank you. Um, my name is Ken Kirk. Um, this will be my fourth year coaching. Um, our team is the Electric Legos. Um, we've actually picked up a second team this year. Um, their name is going to be Technical Difficulties. Um, <laughs> it's a good name for the team, um, especially if you knew the kids. But um, we uh, we also coach or we also coordinate the robotics program for uh, Drag Freak Elementary. I'm Lane. I'm his other half. Um, we do coordinate for Dry Creek Elementary. We started that last year. We had five teams that we oversaw last year. We didn't coach all those teams. We just kind of helped them get started. And we have four teams this year. Uh, two of them have brand new coaches. And then one is our team and one is second year coaches. And uh, we also uh, picked up a team in distress last year and helped them finish out their season. So we have uh, done two teams before. Uh, wouldn't necessarily recommend it, but that's what we're doing this year because um, we have our Alta Sierra team and then we have a Dry Creek team this year. All right. Hello. Yeah. Okay. All right. So if you guys want to talk about posit some positives and negatives of what you guys went through as your first year coaching and how that improved over over time, you can go ahead and start with that. Yeah, first year is drinking from a fire hose. Um, I want to commend all of you who are first year coaches for stepping up. I'm sure you've got a kid that came home and say, hey, mom, dad, I'm interested in robotics. They need a coach. Can you do it? And you love your kids, so you did it. So thank you for doing that. Um, it is definitely a lot of information to take in. Um, it's, it's different from other activities in, in sports and stuff that your kids do because, you know, if you're coaching soccer, then you've got to practice during the week. You've got a game on Saturday. Uh, do the same thing again next week. This is all, every single practice you have in meeting is leading up to a championship. It's project-based, so you've got, all the work has to be done ahead of time, and you're pretty much just implementing on the day of. So I encourage you to check out Central Valley um, Robotics website. They have a lot of information, a lot of good information um, on there about what you should be doing, how to get your team organized. Um, and also First Lego League's uh, website, too, has a lot of guides for first-year coaches. Um, probably the biggest thing I would tell uh, any first-year coach is it's not all about the robot. You know that we, we think of robotics, we're thinking, okay, it's the robot, let's focus on the robot, let's program the robot, let's do everything on the robot. That's important, but equally as important are the core values and the projects. So when you're, when you're working with your teams, um, don't skimp on those two things because make sure they know the core values, but also make sure they're living them out at their practices and that they know how to demonstrate those and also spend as much time on the project too because that's that's really cool it gives a chance for um, the kids to exercise their creativity um, innovate and and solve a real world problem and it it uh, a lot of the kids like the project just as much if not more than the robots so definitely focus on that too okay 
trying to think where I want to start. There's so, there's just so much. Um, so that's where I'll start. Basically, in the first year, there is so much. So you kind of have to go through, um, you know, all of the expectations and the basic requirements. Just give yourself, as a primary coach, give yourself that list. What are the basic things that we have to do? We have to know the core values and understand what they mean and how to apply them. And we have to be able to apply them. <laughs> um, you have to do the project. Uh, the first year that I went to the, my very first basic intro meeting on campus, we had another experienced coach come and talk to our group. And he said, oh my gosh, the first year I didn't even know we had to do the project. He said, so we scrambled for like three or four weeks and we got the project done. So it is very important that you understand what the basic expectations are. You can take this program to the hilt you can do just the basics. In either way, your kids will have a fantastic experience. Um, if as a first year coach, you just focus on the basics, that's what we did the first year. Um, we got a judges award. The kids were so excited, but we hit every one of those basic requirements. And I'm, I can't stress enough how critical that part is. Um, so related to the project, related to the core values, but also the robot. And with the robot, it was so basic, our, our kids kind of followed the instruction booklet for putting it together, made a couple adjustments, and that was about it for what they did. We just did a couple of, well, maybe three or four missions that first year. Um, <coughs> but it was very simple. Our robot design was simple. Our programming was simple. They were learning. I had fourth graders, I mean, and they were all boys. I had seven boys, so it was, oh my goodness, <laughs> a lot of crowd management. Um, so. That would be my number one thing, is to just know the basics of what the requirements are and make sure that you hit those. Um. And like Michael was saying in the keynote, read those manuals over and over. Highlight, know those rules, know the expectations. Um, don't find yourself surprised on competition day. Um, it's really disappointing when your team has missed something and it was in there. Um, those are a really good guide for what you need to know. Um, you need to make sure you share your project with somebody, anybody. Um, Ken has been a judge before, and it's just really hard when a team will have just an amazing project that they've done, and they didn't share it with a single person, so they can't advance. Uh, that disqualifies you. Yes. Yeah, because that is a definite requirement for moving on in the competition is you have to share your project. Um, Ken would even like be fishing. Did you have your neighbor come over and tell them, you know, anybody, you, you have to share. Um, one idea even is um, I take our four teams that we have at Dry Creek and I take them around to their classrooms so they can share uh, with their fellow classmates. Um, and it's really good for them to have the experience of um, presenting to their peers um, you can also go back and um, hopefully you meet with experts as you're uh, researching for your project. You can go back and share with that expert what you came up with uh, because of your time that you spent with them. Um, another thing that a lot of first year coaches ask us is, does everybody have to know how to program the robot? Um, I would say to that is, um, as you get going along in the season, you're going to find that each kid is gonna find their niche. Uh, one is going to be really good at engineering, uh, maybe attachments on the robot. One kid is going to be really passionate about the project and research and presenting. Another kid is going to be really good at the program and it's just going to click with him. And that's okay. They all need to know a little bit about everything, but it's okay for them to defer to whoever is um, the expert at that. Um, you can have a core values expert, um, a child who is really good at knowing the core values and really good at facilitating a conversation. So you can call him uh, the core values master if you'd like. But he does need to know how the robot works. He just might not know all the little tiny details of the programming, and that is absolutely okay. So you don't need to be overwhelmed with every kid having to know every move on that robot. Um, they do, do need to have a hand in it. But it's okay if the judge asks you, well, what does this thing on the code mean? You can say, well, actually, 
Billy is the one that uh, came up with that. And that's okay for them to defer because at least the judges know that they know what's going on. Um, so I think that uh, takes a lot of pressure off you as a coach to make sure every kid is programming every single thing because uh, we've had a team of 10 for the last three years. Um, that is a lot to have gathered around a computer. Uh, so you might have three over here building attachments. You might have three over here working on the project and you can kind of rotate them around. So uh, give yourself some grace on that as well um, because as you get going, the kids are naturally going to fall into where uh, they feel they best fit. Okay, so our first year we had a kiddo who wanted nothing to do with programming. Wonderful, awesome team member, um, so kind, did so many wonderful things within our group. He just looked at the robot and he's like, I'm not interested. So what we did for him, and especially the program, he's like, too much, overload, I don't, I'm not even there. Um, so for him, one of the ways that we brought him in was we made sure he understood how we decided which mission to pick. So, you know, and then when we got into our judging session, they asked, well, why didn't you guys pick this one? He was able to answer that question. So it wasn't technical because there are definitely going to be a few kids, not, not too many, but there will be a few kids who really are not interested in the technical part. Um, we also had a year where all, except that kiddo, um, our whole team wanted to program, and they're just insistent. We want to program. We didn't get to do it much last year, and I really want to. We really want to. So there are some times where it didn't seem to be falling into place, and one of the ways we handled that was we gave them, um, we signed out the actual robot, and we said, okay, take the robot home this week. You have to download the program, and you have to program this robot to go down your hall, do a U-turn, and come back. Um, or make an obstacle course and, and, and make it happen. So we did push them to <coughs> um, do a lot of this work independently, and then it started to fall in place. The kids who came back with additional knowledge, look what I learned. They were excited to show their teammates what they figured out. Um, some of them came back and they, they said, I worked on this for so long, and the parents were like, oh, my gosh, we worked and worked, but they didn't get it. Those were the kids who became our programmers that year, um, and it was all about how much effort they were putting into it, whereas some of them came back and they're like, yeah, it was kind of hard. I couldn't really do it. And like, okay, well, then you're not doing programming this week. So if you want to take it home again another time. So that was kind of how we managed it. Rather than us saying, you can do it, you can do it, it was you need to show us how much you're going to put into it. You need to show us that you really want to do this. Um, not all of our teamwork, not all of our work, our for the team um, happened in our sessions. We did send them home with homework and that became much more apparently necessary as we went on in the years. The fourth graders, it was a little harder, but or by sixth grade, um, they definitely could handle that. So that was one of the ways that we worked through some of that issue. The project, we did push them all. They had to have a role. None of them wanted to research and do these things until they started researching. They're like, oh, this is interesting. Hey, check this out. And then they realize, okay, this is actually kind of cool. Um, and the core values, we did, we did that at every meeting. So I can touch on that later. But did you guys want to, anything else on the? Uh, so as I said, we had a team of 10 our first year. And um, not every kid is comfortable speaking publicly or in front of adults. And um, I'll let you know that we had three kids who did not want a speaking role at all. Um, they helped us with research. They went on our trips to uh, gather all our information. They helped write the skit that we presented, um, but they were literally plants. We glued leaves onto them, and they stood there. Um, and that's okay. They were really good plants. Um, they had little tags hanging on them, like identifying what kind of plant they were. Um, but I'll let you know that those three kids last year presented in front of 200 math teachers for Clovis Unified. And so um, they may not get everything the first year, but the first year is their foundation. And they're going to grow not only in robotics, but in their other classes and their other avenues. And so it's just a really good foundation, a really good bonding experience. You know, they're encouraging one another. Um, so it's just been really exciting to see, sitting where we are now, how far these boys have come when they were a plant the first year. 
So that's just a little encouragement to you. You know, as long as they have an active role in everything, you know, they might get terrified as talking in front of adults, and, you know, that's okay. Um, it's not detrimental as long as they have a role behind the scenes and everywhere else. Yeah, to that point, I'm, I'm a big fan of beginning with the end in mind. So if, if the end for us, if the reason that we're here is just to win a robotics competition, 99% of us are going to get disappointed, right? And that's not a very good success factor. So if you're here and you, you've got this team and you keep saying, okay, we're going to win this competition, probably not the right motivation. Um, again, it's, it's the progress that these kids can make through this program. The nice thing about it is it is so um, multidisciplinary. I mean, you've got science and technology, you've got public speaking, you've got research, you've got all these different things that these kids are going to learn over the course of the season and how to create an, an innovative solution, not just for these robot missions, but also in real life to help out an animal somehow. I mean, that's something they can take with them uh, through their entire life. There's some uh, teams throughout the country that their project has actually gone on and become real products in the world um, and have changed some lives. So it's, it's a really cool thing. So in, in beginning with the end in mind, keep in mind that the most important tool that we have, and it's going to kind of sound weird, but is failure. And it's, it's when you're looking at those missions and your robot just can't do it. So you're trying something and it fails, trying something and fails. But when you fail a dozen times and then you finally, your team gets to the point where they succeed, the success is so much sweeter. And, and failure is a real tool that these kids are learning through this program that it's okay to fail. It's okay t as long as you're learning, right? So we learn through those failures. We, we've got this project. We're trying to figure out how to make you know, something better with these animals, and we just can't figure it out. It keeps failing. Um, but once they get that success, it's so much better in the end. So encourage them because that's the whole nature of the season is they're going to try and try and try and keep, keep failing. And once they get to that point where they succeed, that's huge. And that's something that is really going to stick with them. And that's something they really get to showcase during the tournaments. It's kind of a day to come together. You're showing off your project. You're doing your core values. Um, you're running your robot on the mission board. And it's all about the successes that you've learned over the season um, that have come through adversity. So keep encouraging them, especially um, for the first year coaches, because again, this is all new stuff. Um, so don't have winning a robotics competition as your goal. Um, have learning as your goal and innovation and um, getting those, those skill sets learned by the, the kids of, hey, we figured out how to get the robot to sense a line. That's a huge success. Um, or maybe on, on the project, we, we met with an expert and we learned about dogs, whatever, whatever that is. Um, so celebrate those successes, and in the end, celebrate your season, regardless of whether or not you move on to championship, because realistically, only about half the teams are going to move on to championship. So I'd encourage you, don't define championship as the measure of success. Um, look for those successes during the season. Uh, our team, the first season that we had them, um, they did not move on to championship, and it was heartbreaking. There was tears, but I think that was, that was on us as coaches. Um, we had set that expectation of, okay, we're going we're gonna to get to championship, that's our goal. And when we didn't get there, uh, it was very disappointing for the team. Um, so, again, set those expectations. They actually, it actually became a motivator, though, for them because um, they didn't make it through to, through to the championship, but they didn't want to quit. Um, so they said, well, let's, let's get back together in the spring next year. And so we did, and we learned more about programming and the robot. And their motivation and their focus level was different in the second year. Because they kind of knew it was a stake, and they knew that, okay, I don't want to go through that experience of, you know, just ending at championship again because we kind of, or ending at the qualifier not making it to championship because we kind of set the expectation wrong. But um, they were motivated, and they were a lot more driven, and we ended up um, getting a champions award at our qualifier the next year. Um, so completely different, um, different team the second year, even though same kids, but completely different motivation and different um, focus that they had after going through some of that adversity in the first year. So again, even if you don't make it a championship, um, celebrate the season that you've had and encourage the kids and help them to learn through those experiences. All right, thank you guys. Um, I actually get this question a lot from a lot of new um, coaches for First Lego League. So if you guys could elaborate a little bit more on how often did you guys meet? Um, how did you manage those meetings? Um, and if
if you got parent involvement, and how did you get parent involvement? Okay, so our standard meeting, we met at our house on Sundays for three hours. <laughs> so every Sunday, that was our, um, our standard. And then as the season went on and we realized we needed some extra time, then we would add maybe a weeknight where a couple of kids came or two or three kids came. And sometimes we did that a couple times during the week. Um, at some point, we added Wednesday afternoons, started to be a standard for the whole group as well, and that was about an hour. So we did the three hours at our house and then every week, and then we did, it was a, about an hour on Wednesday afternoons. So for us, we had the early release time, and I worked with our um, school site staff to find a place on campus. So that one was on campus, uh, which meant we couldn't do any robot stuff, so it was really helpful for those kids. That's kind of was their only thing they were super interested in. I'm sorry, we can't do that today. This is core value and project time. We can talk about some robot stuff if we have time, but we're focusing on these other things for the Wednesdays. Um, so that's how often we met. And then parent involvement, we had our first year, in the beginning, like we said, it was kind of drinking from a fire hose. So we wanted parent involvement as coaches, but I had no idea what to tell them to do or how to help us. Um, and so in the beginning, they're like, well, okay, well, if you don't need, they were so nice. They, well, if you don't need anything, we'll, we'll go. And so then they didn't stick around. And then later I'm like, oh, I wish somebody was here for that or whatever it was. So by the second year, we realized we may not have anything for you to do at all. Please just stay and watch. And if I have some, and it's going to, and, and I'm sorry if it feels awkward. I know we're kind of like man in the group and we're taking charge. But um, with, then I started to notice, okay, well, whenever we broke into groups, I always had something for the parent to do. So, um, and it was helpful to have some of the parents be consistent as opposed to having them on a rotating schedule because then when they came, they didn't know what we were working on or what was going on. So by our third year, we had one parent who was highly consistent, and I, oh my gosh, she was basically a, a second lead coach. Um, but when we started that season, she didn't, I mean, I didn't even know what to tell her to do in the very beginning other than help with paperwork. <laughs> so all of the registering, and get, have you guys registered your teams already? Have you, do you have all the paperwork and permission slips from all the parents? Most, any of you guys still have a lot of paperwork or registering to do? Okay, so assign that to a parent. <laughs> um, it takes a lot of time, or it did for us. It took a lot of time. And as a coach, there were so many other things I wanted to focus on, but I was just trying to get the paperwork together. So um, it's not a massive amount when that's all you're doing, but when you're trying to do all these other things and just figure out what to do, it's helpful to just hand off some of those things. So anytime you can designate a job to a parent, we had um, – one parent organized a snack schedule. So we had three-hour meetings, which is very long for eight boys that are in fourth grade. <laughs> so we had snack time. And when we did that, we made sure that we had that on a rotating schedule so we always had something available. Um, and we made that part of, we made that an activity as well. Um, so the parent involvement for our team, it varied quite a bit. Um, but I would, I would say designate a parent or two who's capable of being able to be there fairly consistently and have them just come. You will find things for them to help you manage, help you do. You can assign them some activities, or maybe you can have them communicate with your other parents. Um, but at least a couple per meeting would be huge. Yeah, we actually did that, um, that same thing our second season. We figured out, okay, there's 10 kids. We need some help just maintaining law and order. Um, so we would have uh, parents sign up for, you know, they'd each kind of pick a meeting to come to, and their job was just kind of helping to maintain that, that focus because the coaches, we could work with maybe two or three kids at a time and then these two or three kids, but with 10, you've got some that are on their own working on something, and pretty soon you look and they're wrestling or climbing on couches or whatever. So... Um, again, it's kind of the nature of the program. It gets a little crazy. So um, maintaining that order is good. For our meetings, uh, I, we'd meet uh, twice a week, um, typically an hour and a half to two hours per meeting. Um, for us, it's been one weekday and then um, a Saturday afternoon uh, is what we've been doing. 
Um, our meetings, we'll try to split it up and not spend an entire meeting on project or an entire meeting on robot, but we'll um, try to cover all three in a meeting. So um, spend some time on the project, spend some time on the robot and programming and problem solving, and then also um, have some kind of core values component to it um, where either we're going over the core values or we're doing some kind of core values challenge. Um, if you haven't um, already like searched for core values challenge, search for it like on Google, First Lego League, Core Values Challenge. You'll see a bunch of examples that you can run with your kids. Um, a really basic one that we did, uh, one of our very first meetings that we did was we, we just call it spaghetti marshmallows. So we had some spaghetti, some marshmallows, and the Core Values Challenge we gave them was, okay, build the tallest structure you can using just these materials. Um, and it was kind of funny because at the time it was their very first meeting and they didn't really work together as a team and so it was utter chaos um, and it was great and they all built their own thing and it was just, the complete opposite of what you should be doing. Um, but from that experience, we would always kind of point back to that. Anytime they were doing something on their own and not working together as a team, we would tell them, oh, this spaghetti marshmallow stuff. And then they realized, okay, we need to work together as a team. And we'd redo that challenge like uh, later in the season and they did work together as a team. They'd kind of brainstorm, how should we build it? What should we do? Um, and build one structure. So that's a, a fun one that we did. Um, another thing I'd encourage you to do is anytime you can, leverage technology um, in your meetings. One of the best meetings that we had this last year that we actually got the most stuff done is when we didn't meet together. It sounds kind of weird, but we had a meeting. It was Tuesday, I think, 6.30 p.m. to 8 p.m. And we said, okay, every rather than everyone coming to our house, everyone stay at your own house. You guys are all um, on Google Docs because you guys all have a Clovis Unified account. So get onto Google Docs. We've got one doc that we're all going to be working on together. It was related to our project. And um, we had an online collaboration session for one of our meetings. And it was fantastic because you didn't have a lot of the chaos that kind of comes about with the regular meetings. Um, and I don't know if anyone's used Google Docs, but everyone can edit the exact same document all in real time. And as a coach, I can sit there and look and offer comments and suggestions while they're writing in real time. So um, leverage technology as you can. It was a very, very productive meeting and no one got together that day. So it was really cool. I'd say another way to get your parents involved without them actually being there is update them on what's going on with the team. Um, if we had something exciting happen, sometimes uh, Ken would film it and we put it on our YouTube channel and we'd let the parents watch. Like, look what your kids did today. Like, they solved a really big problem that they've been working on for weeks and we had a big success and they can see us all cheering at the end. Um, sometimes we send them like a group text message, like we had a really great meeting, um, they solved this problem or they worked really well together. Um, we would also encourage the parents, you know, work with your kids on the core values, help them to memorize those core values, you know, just have those little talking moments, uh, maybe after a soccer game even, like, uh, you know, how did you show core values during your soccer game with your teammates? Uh, because they'll need to apply those things when they're talking to the judges during the core value session. And um, I do encourage, like he was saying, do core values challenges often. Um, uh, once a week if you can uh, come up with uh, the, the challenges. And one important thing to know with that is the end result is not what is important, it's how you get there. So even with the spaghetti marshmallows, if they had been communicating well and the structure still did not stand, that would have been a success uh, because they were working together, everyone was being heard, they weren't berating one, one another. Um, so that's what they're looking for, time management, talking to each other. Um, it'd be really great to have a really tall tower, of course, um, but it's the process and how you get there. Okay, I just wanted to piggyback real quick because as they're talking, I, I keep remembering some things. <coughs> One of the things that we finally got into place was when kids were dropped off, we had the parents check them in and check them out. So it became a habit where they were just getting dropped off at the curb um, which is fine. I mean, they were all old enough to be able to walk up our walk and come in the house, and they were doing fine with that, but the parents were not aware of what was going on, or maybe there was a behavioral issue that day. It didn't give us a chance to check in. They just left. Then I had to make a phone call, or I had to email, and I had then I had more work to do. So we did get a check-in, check-out. You physically, as a parent, we need you to come walk to the door. Even if it's an older sibling, we had that as well. So that was helpful. Um, and then I also sent out weekly emails, um, and it just had tons of information. It could have been about a field trip. It could have been about a different practice time, who was signed up for the next snack. It was the t-shirt information and ordering that, how much money, who had what. 
there's just so many little pieces that I just eventually I'm like, okay, I'm just sending out a weekly email. And it did take a lot of time to generate those, but it was incredibly helpful. Parents knew what was going on. So, and then we did have a Facebook page, but it was only minimally used. But that was something else we did. I did not do Google Docs. That was a little beyond my <laughs> skill set at the time. Right. We actually wrote a robotics code of conduct this year, and that is on there. Um, that uh, once your team has chosen a qualifier date, you will commit to being there, regardless if there's a dance recital or a birthday party or a wrestling tournament. Um, we had a team last year um, from our school. They had three people missing at the qualifier, one at a wrestling tournament, two at a dance recital. Um, they did not do well uh, because they were key people. Um, the robot started malfunctioning, and the one who was most uh, comfortable with the robot wasn't there. Um, so they really struggled, and it was really disappointing. All that work went into a competition that they really didn't have a chance to succeed at because they were missing. Um, so you'll let them know, hey, we've chosen this qualifier date, and you will commit to being there. And uh, at our school, they can use robotics as part of their block award, the block DC award, and we've let them know if they don't make that competition, they cannot get their block DC credit. So, I mean, it's really important because, um, like he was saying with soccer, you know, you practice, you play, you practice, you play. This is it. You have to put all your eggs in one basket, and so they have to commit to being there. So I agree. All right. Thank you, coaches. So some... A little bit different approaches to different things from very accomplished coaches from very accomplished teams. Um, so I really appreciate that, guys. Um, so I think the main theme there was keep parents informed, keep them involved, use your resources as you have them. Um, so I appreciate that, guys. Uh, we're going to open it up to Q&A now from the audience. So if anyone has any questions, just raise your hand and I'll come to you. So on average, what was your time commitment to, to lead your team on a weekly basis? Is it about, sounds like at least four to five, up towards the ten. Yeah, at least four to five. Um, some weeks more than that because, you know, depending on what you're doing for the meeting, maybe you're prepping, um, you know, you're online searching for a core values challenge or you're, um, we watched a lot of YouTube videos just as, as ideas on how to, you know, program different stuff. So I'd be searching for the right video to watch. So, yeah. If you figure four and five hours on a weekly basis, and then, of course, as you get closer to a championship, maybe it's a little bit more um, generally. And sometimes uh, your field trips to the experts will take place of like a regular meeting at your house. So you can either do that in addition to or instead of. All right, thank you. Anything else? A percentage of meetings, breakout sessions, where do you recommend having kids team up, groups of two, groups of three, and they do breakout sessions, or or did you have most success with you know spaghetti mush, spaghetti um, marshmallows all working together at the same time? Because you, obviously you're sharing a lot of information with the more kids you have, but then it can also turn into Lord of the Flies. Where is that? Where is that? Where is that balance? Good description. Yeah, we um. It's funny because we set out with the intention of, okay, they're going to break up and some are going to do projects, some are going to do robots, some are going to do this. And I'd say at least, you know, four out of five times, they're all kind of 
doing everything all at once, which was kind of chaotic. But um, the nice thing about all of them doing everything together is they're all on the same page. They're all he hearing the same message, uh, especially when you're doing core values activities. You do, do want the entire team doing it all at the same time because you want them getting used to working in the full group. But um, contrary to that, you do need to break out into some smaller groups. Um, for example, when we're working on the robot, we would have maybe two kids on the computer programming, one doing the work, one watching and offering suggestions, maybe a couple working on a specific attachment, they're trying to get to do something, and the other is actually like running the robot on the board and testing after the programming's done. So there's ways to break up into smaller groups even when you're all doing the same thing. Um, same thing on project, maybe um, a couple are working on some research, a couple are some working on a script for a presentation, and it's, there's ways to break up even inside of everyone doing the same thing. Sorry, I don't mean to cut you off, but then would you say breakout sessions that should be by challenge or by task? So all the programming versus, no, you're gonna, you two are going to do the first challenge, you two are going to do the next challenge, you two are going to do the next challenge. Uh, yeah, so by I'd task? Say, I'd say it really depends on the team um, because like we were saying earlier, there's some kids that are going to gravitate toward the programming, others that want nothing to do with it. Um, we've got one kid on our team, he, this is his fourth year, I think he's yet to program anything, but he's a really good engineer, so he likes to build stuff. Um, so I wouldn't encourage, I wouldn't say you have to rotate through each task with every single kid. Um, it's When you're breaking it out, I think it's trying to find um, the things that they really want to do and helping them to be able to do those things. Um, but at the same time, trying to divide and conquer and make sure stuff's getting done with a larger group. I don't know if that answers your question, but. Okay, so I think you asked, an, you asked about this specific to the robot, pro, uh, the gaming, and then also kind of more in general. So I'll answer that. So we started every meeting as a whole group. We all sat down together in a circle and we said, what are we here to accomplish today? And we made lists. We had those giant, you know, big giant post-it notes up on the wall. They, they weren't. It was just poster. I used tape, but it was cheaper. <laughs> but um, it was one of those things that it helped us. It helped the kids have an understanding of what we're focusing on that day. So um, we started every group as a as a every meeting as a whole group, and we ended as a whole group as well. So we kind of reviewed what did we accomplish today, and we had some meetings where we intended to do maybe five things, and we didn't get through any of them. We didn't actually complete any of them. And so it was really helpful for the kids to go, oh, okay. And then we had, um, I just took a small post-it note and I said, these are all of our meeting dates until our qualifier or championship. And every time <coughs> we met, we would take one off. And so we would look at the number of post-it notes that are sitting there and then how much we had on our to-do list of all the things we had to accomplish by that um, either a qualifier or a championship, and it gave them a reference point. So we started and ended each session together. Throughout the meeting, we rarely were together as an entire group, just because there's so much con conf opportunities for conflict that it made it harder. So we partnered them up. I want you two to work on this. I want you two to work on this. Um, or it would be pick a partner. What aspect do you want to work on? maybe like specific to the project. Um, and so when we did the core value activities, in the beginning, especially this past year, we had a lot of conflict. It was not going well. It was our largest group. We had some new members. It was just kind of a different dynamic. Um, so I did split them up into two groups of four, and we did core value projects separate so that they could experience some success and what it's supposed to feel like. And then we would start working towards larger groups for core value projects um, or activities. Uh, specific to the robot game, I think you were asking about that too. We had a hard time figuring out how to, like, like they had um, some kids programming and then they had some working on attachments. That was hard for our team because as they programmed, they were changing the attachment off and on, um, trying to figure out how does it work? I've got another, make a different rotate. All these little aspects. So basically, and it was hard for there to be three kids. So we learned it needs to be two kids working on, on the robot. Um, and this is the mission you're focusing on now. 
So like I had said before, we had some nights where maybe just a couple of kids would come over in the evening. Maybe when they came over, they were working on a totally different mission. So those kids would be responsible for that mission, whereas other kids would be responsible for a different mission. But we could never figure out a way to do that when we had our whole group meeting at the same time. That was too hard for us. So when we did do breakout sessions in our meetings, um, we did not have them working on the same thing, if that makes sense. <laughs> um, it just kind of depended on what we were trying to get through that day. Does that help give a little bit more information? Or okay, All right, thank you. It sounds like it's very team-specific there for that question. All right, do I have our next question? All right. How do you coach um, the project when they're trying to define a problem that they'll research? I guess the hardest thing is um, I might have an idea as a coach, but how do you mentor them in that? Um, I think it's very important, if at all possible, for the kids to come up with the project on their own. They really need to own it. So uh, we started brainstorming even just this year with the whiteboard. Um, and I kind of took them through um, specific areas where animals might be involved. It could be on a global scale. It could be on a national scale, state local in your neighborhood like what problems do you see with animals so it's just a big brainstorming thing and sometimes um, a kid will know something about it already um, they might have an uncle who's a vet who talked about something or they might have gone to the aquarium and seen something and so I think brainstorming is very important you can kind of guide them and direct them once they start going a particular way like I have tons of ideas for this year floating in my head that I'm going to keep right here um, but, um, yeah, once they start brainstorming, then they start feeding off one another, and then you, you can send them out to research. Why don't you just research um, or go talk, you know, you're going to go on field trips too, and you can go to field trips without having an idea yet. Um, that's what happened with our project last year um, for the trash trek. We just were going to different places trying to figure out what to do, and um, something one of the experts said just sparked our idea, and then it went from there. We didn't know it was going to be that, um, but that's just kind of where it took off. Yeah, the, uh, in addition to coaching, I've volunteered as a judge three times, and I've twice done project. And as a project judge, the last thing you want to hear is when you're asking the team ab about their project is, so how'd you guys come up with this idea? And one of the kids says, well, our coach told us about it, and we thought it was a good idea. So don't, don't go down that road. Even if you, I'm sure we all have as, as coaches have, man, if they could just work on this idea, that'd be perfect. Um, don't be so concerned about the perfect project so much as we should be concerned about their project. Make sure it's 100% theirs, their idea, their solution. Even if deep down you're thinking, this is never going to work. Uh, don't tell them that. Encourage them because they might surprise you. They might figure out a way that you never even thought of to do something. And you're sitting back as a coach thinking, oh, that's really cool. I, need, I didn't think that was going to work, but it did. This was a huge issue for our team our first year. So I really appreciate that question <laughs> because um, as coaches, we all of a sudden at one moment, my husband and I, because he was my co-coach, we looked at each other and we're like, um, that's our, like, <laughs> but we had to navigate that so the kids couldn't feel that. Um, and so one of the things we did was we had them ask each other questions about their specific ideas because we came to the table We had eight different ideas all totally different project ideas. They could not They did not go together. So they initially tried to make them all blend together That didn't go very well. Then they tried um, they, Well, let's just vote well, then we had some kids who were really upset so that didn't go very well the process of all this was wonderful uh, but it, it was a lot of holding our own tongue. Uh, one of the things that we found helpful, and we did it more than one year, was we had them take their favorite ideas, uh, and maybe it was their, usually it was their own, plus maybe one or two others, and then we sent them home, and we said, you need to go talk, we, had, we made them do a poll. Go talk to 10 people and ask what they think the uh, pros and cons of something like this would be. And that came back oh my gosh, it was so helpful. They were like, okay, well, they said this and that. Okay, well, how are you going to solve that problem? What do you think would be an answer to that? Well, I don't know. Well, do you want to look into that or do you want to look into this other idea? 
and, and that helped it filter down tremendously. But getting them to go talk to other people, family, friends, neighbors. One year we had them leave our house and go in my neighborhood. And I said, you need to go in partners. You stay on these two streets. And I knew all my neighbors. <laughs> I said, go knock on the doors and ask their opinion. Here's five questions. You need to get answers from them and see what they would have to say. It was tremendous help to help narrow that down. Um, but they will come up with some outlandish ideas, which is fine because this project allows for that. But at the same time, they need to be something you can work with and get, you know, make solid. So, Can you elaborate on the, because last year's challenge was Trash Trek, um, how the field trip kind of helped um, something that sparked the project? Sure. So um, one of our boys... Um, found that recycling pizza boxes was a really big problem. So we were thinking maybe it would go somewhere along the lines of pizza boxes, how to recycle them and whatnot. Um, and so um, we have a friend who works for a box manufacturing company. And so um, he spoke to the kids about how to manufacture boxes. And then they asked him about, you know, greasy boxes not being able to be recycled. And he let them know about a product that already existed called TexGuard that they use for uh, like produce boxes and pastry boxes, but it's never been used on pizza boxes before. Um, so our kids started researching like the implications of using that on pizza boxes so that 100% of pizza boxes could be recyclable. And so it just kind of took off from there. They even made a prototype uh, of the box using one of the already made uh, fruit boxes from the uh, box manufacturing company. I think we're out of time, yeah? Almost. I think we'll finish up with her last comment. I was just going to say, when we met with um, the city of Clovis, we went in there, we went, sat at a big table. The kids felt very excited to be there. They felt very professional. We had our list of questions. Um, but we learned a lot about our project was focusing on um, uh, what people know about how to recycle in each of the three bins. And so we had a lot of questions about that. And we had the professionals who create the bins and create what goes on them talk to us a little bit about how that's allowed to be changed. So we learned from our field trip that it has to go through the city council. So then we actually added some field trips. We went to the city council, we spoke there, and we had the kids present some information. So one kind of led to another. You just, you kind of have to get an idea and go see where it leads you. If you go in there with, okay, we're going to present this to you and that's it, it's limited. But if you really ask questions and then do something with that information, that's how it helps. Just along those lines, have, don't be afraid to dial for dollars because um, we, we actually got – the research was one of the most fun things that the kids do because one of our field trips that we did after we had the idea is they went and pitched it to me and Ed's. So I, I called them up before I got, the, got to talk to the chief operating officer and said, hey, I've got this robotics team. Would you mind if they came and presented this idea to you? He's like, oh, yeah, one of my kids did, did robotics before. Sure, no problem. So they got to come to the conference room at the me and Ed's headquarters pitch your idea to the chief operating officer of me and Ed's, and for them, that was like the highlight of the season. So um, definitely have fun with the research part and, you know, make some calls, see what you can get away with when you call someone up and say, hey, I've got this robotics team. Yeah, they got free pizza for me and Ed's, yeah. All right. Well, unfortunately, that is all the time we have for questions. So if your question didn't get answered, uh, maybe stick around and maybe our coaches will have a little bit of time to answer them for you. Um, the next session happening here is the Meet the Experts project panel. So if you're wondering about some ideas to kind of get you guys thinking, um, we'll have experts from the community out here talking about that kind of stuff. So um, thank you to our coaches. Can we get a round of applause for uh, Lisa, Ken, and Lane? We really appreciate you guys coming out. I especially appreciate you guys coming out and doing this for us. Um, that was a very good talk, so thank you all, and I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>